So would you turn in your Bible tonight to Ephesians chapter 5? Ephesians chapter 5 with me, if you will. My wife and I have and continue to enjoy having our grandchildren uh, stay with us. There, We had quite a few of them drop in over the last uh, couple of weeks. We have two that are still remaining with us. But anyway, <laughs> one of the things that kids like to do is they like to they like to be copycats, right? Uh, sometimes they play copycat and they repeat everything you say and uh, they imitate all your gestures. Uh, kids are pretty good at that. In fact, kids try to become like those that they are around the most. And our children often pick up and they mimic their parents' character, the way their parents talk, the way their parents uh, gesture or carry themselves. In Ephesians 5 and verse 1 and verse 2, note this. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. See the word followers in the first verse? I wanted to call that word to your attention because that word in the original language the New Testament was written in, we derive our English word mimic from. Mimic. And so we have a command. This is, uh, this is an imperative in verse 1. You are commanded to be mimics, if you will, of God as his dear children. We're to mimic God. It's rather amazing. I mean, come on, who is qualified to play God? But what's the real meaning of this be you imitators or mimics of God? Well, I think the explanation is in the following verse that we've read, verse 2. And so I want to share some thoughts with you from that second verse in particular after we pause a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we don't deserve the least bit of the mercies of God that we are the recipients of. We're the glad recipients of. And we are so thankful tonight that we can know you, the only true God, your son, the Lord Jesus, who is the exposition of you, who is the exegesis of the Father. We come to know you through him. And we're so grateful tonight for this passage of scripture and ask that you might open our spiritual eyes and burn it into our spiritual heart to accomplish the purpose for which you would have us to look at it this evening. And may Jesus be praised and may our hearts be and lives be enriched. We pray for his sake. Amen. Now I want you to look at that second verse again. Here's how we are to mimic. There's, this is how we're to mimic the Lord. We are, first of all, notice this, we're to walk. We're to walk. When I think of walk, I think of that being a key word in the beginning book of the Bible. The book of Genesis is all about people that walk with God really model people, people that modeled faith, that walked with the Lord and were worthy of him calling them his friends. God wants us to be like people that walk with him. And when you walk with someone, you have a relationship that you have formed with them. And so God wants us to be like those that walk with him he wants this kind of relationship with us. It is our walk with God that determines really how we think 
and how we conduct ourselves, how we act. And when you stop and think about walking, you realize that to walk is not a single action. Uh, when we walk, it is a reiterated step after step after step. So when we talk about walking, it's a command not to do one specific thing and that's it, but it's really, it's talking about a pattern of life. It's talking about a pattern of unbroken fellowship with God that ought to characterize our lives. When you see believers being called in the Bible to walk, you should understand that he's talking about a lifestyle. This is what your life ought to look like. This ought to be the pattern of your life. The biblical emphasis is a pattern rather than single acts that you do. In fact, I find, and I'm sure you do too, that often the single acts in my life don't match and don't fit the pattern of my life. I experienced that in a big way in my mind just last week when I had a particular attitude toward an unsafe person that, whoa, after I got quiet and got before the Lord, I was so rebuked by him. You know, here, I'm supposed to love these people. Uh, God wants to reach them. God wants to save them. And my attitude was, I could strangle that person. You know, you know what I mean? So sometimes single acts don't fit the lifestyle. Don't fit the pattern. We're to walk. God wants us to live in a way that is consistent. And I'm convinced that one of the keys to raising children that follow the Lord is parental consistency. Parents that are consistent in their walk with God. And when we see the word walk, I want you to think of the word consistent, a pattern of life. So here's what we are to do. We're to be imitators of God. We're to be God's mimics as his dear children. How do we do that? We walk with him. There is a consistency. There's a pattern in our life that is identifiable. But then look at how we are to walk. He says, walk in what? Walk in love. Walk in love. And that word, you've probably heard uh, the Greek word thrown around. It's common in Christian circles. It's the word agape, right? Well, did you know that that specific word for love is only found in the New Testament? It is not. It, it is a word that was non-existent in secular Greek language because the kind of love that agape defines is a love that the Greeks knew nothing of. In fact, it's foreign to human thinking. The New Testament definition of this word for love, agape, is simply this. It is that you as a person care more about others than you care for yourself. That's what agape love is. It's more than loving your neighbor as yourself. It's loving your neighbor more than you love yourself. It's a love in which the well-being of others is more important to you than your own well-being. Walk in love. It's, a, it's that kind of love that he's calling us to consistently manifest walk in love. And Christ is the pattern for that kind of living. You know, we get wowed at the signs and wonders in the gospel that Jesus did. But why did he do that? You know why he performed the miracles he performed? <laughs> because he was walking in love. Because he was saying, it's not my will. 
I'm more concerned about others than I am about myself. Which leads me uh, then to say that to walk in love is to walk in an attitude of being selfless. Being selfless. You know, I thought I thought about it. I talk about selflessness and anti-selfishness and sacrif uh, sacrificial living a lot. And I ask myself, why do I keep bringing this up? And I've come to the conclusion because God brings it up. That's what the Bible's about. You know, <clears throat> the New Testament obviously is uh, gives the gospel to sinners, but the bulk of the New Testament is the, the word, the gospel to believers, which is sanctification. You know what sanctification is about? It's about de denying and dying to yourself. And so here we are again. Walk in love. Be consistent. Have a pattern of living that you care more about other people than you do about yourself. Selfless, consistent. What does it mean to be an imitator, a mimic of God? It means to be consistent in your selflessness. He goes deeper. Look again at verse 2 of Ephesians 5. He says, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us. See the word given? And then he says he's given himself as an offering and a sacrifice. I mean, this verse is really, it, it's, it's full of important religious overtones often found in, in Greek religion ritual writings. It's just full of it here. Words that have specific religious meaning as well. So he says, we are to walk in love as Christ loved us and has given himself. A person that gives. A person that makes sex. We are to walk as Christ walked. We're to have a pattern of life consistently where we care about others more than ourselves. We, we, we live selflessly and we are people that make sacrifice. This word given was used in secular Greek uh, pagan writings to refer to people that made sacrifice to their gods. And what he is saying here, that's what Jesus did. He made a sacrifice. He gave himself, notice to who? To God, to his father. And sacrifice for you. There's his selfless sacrifice. So how do you imitate God? <laughs> How do you become a mimic of God? Well, there's that consistency, that walking, and that selfless uh, aspect, walking in love, caring more about others than you do yourself. And But with that selflessness comes a sacrificial spirit, a sacrificial attitude like Jesus. You should give yourself likewise, he's saying, in sacrifice to God for others. Have you done that recently? I mean, for other people, other than your family members. That's easy. That comes natural. Have you given yourself, have you given sacrificially to others that perhaps aren't even your own family members? Notice he says, you're to give yourself sacrificially as Jesus did for us as an offering. See the word offering there? It's the equivalent of the Old Testament word mincha, which is a description of gifts that were given to God. And the word sacrifice, a sacrifice to God, that word sacrifice is the Old Testament uh, word zabach that uh, we actually get the Hebrew word that is translated altar in our Old Testament scriptures. So offerings, 
give yourself as an offering. You know, offerings to God, they were often killed. <laughs> offerings were often killed when they were offered to the Lord. Thought is this, something dies in the process of making an offering to God. Something ends its existence because it's given to the one to use for other purposes. So your walk, your lifestyle is to be consistently a sacrifice in which you give yourself to others as Christ gave himself for you. This language, hanging over the language that Paul uses in that second verse, is Golgotha, the place of the skull. It's the place where that tree that Jesus was hung on stood. That's the shadow that hangs over this particular verse where Jesus sacrificed himself on our behalf. And basically, he wants you to be like him. <laughs> he expects you to offer yourself as a sacrifice for others. Did you know that there is no real religion without sacrifice of some sort? Something that is of value, something that is costly, the worshiper has to give to the object that he or she is worshiping, sacrifice. Have you ever thought about this, though? God turns the whole idea of this sacrifice upside down. Because in religion, people offer something costly or valuable to God. But what we see here in this verse and what is true is that the eternal God gives his greatest possession, the one and only unique son, as the sacrifice for those who worship him. Isn't that amazing? I don't believe that we understand self-sacrifice if we just see it as surrender, if we just see it as capitulating to God's will. Self-sacrifice, if you really understand it, is the human way to freedom. It's the human way to deliverance. And self-sacrificial surrender in a willingness to die to yourself, to your own ambitions, to your own self-interest, God then frees you from all the contamination in your life and enables you to be clean before him. You actually... When you walk in selfless, in a selfless, sacrificial way, giving yourself like that to God, you find freedom and liberty and fulfillment in life. And then look at the verse one more time. We're, we're trying to answer the question, what does it mean to be an imitator or a mimic of God? It means that we have a pattern, a consistent pattern, a walking in love that is caring more about others than we do ourselves, a sacrificial spirit where we're willing to deny ourselves, where we're willing to give ourselves in order for others to be blessed. We kill self-interest in the interest of others. And how does that, uh, what does that do? Notice. It says that we, like Christ, loved us, gave himself as an offering, sacrifice to God. Notice this, for a sweet-smelling savor. Now, a sweet-smelling savor is simply a pleasing, uh, fragrant aroma. Okay? Most of us buy a lot of deodorant to cover our offensive body odor, right? Well, God says that when you care more about someone else than you do for yourself, you become a pleasant, fragrant aroma in his nostrils, a sweet-smelling 
savor. I wonder if we stink in the nostrils of God because of our selfishness, because of our unwillingness to deny ourselves and to take up that cross, that to care more about others than we care about ourselves. You know, one of the valuable gifts that the Magi brought to Jesus in his infancy was frankincense. Frankincense was a very expensive perfume back in that day. I understand that frankincense is uh, derived by slashing or hacking a particular tree with a knife, with a hatchet, whatever, and then they cut away the bark under that, that slash mark below the wound, and the tree will bleed its sap, and the sap drops in tear-shaped form. So the tree cries, the tree weeps, it weeps its sap. They let that sap then harden, and then the pieces of hardened sap are gathered and ground into powder and then dissolved in some type of liquid solvent. So the fact of the matter is it's only when the tree loses its own life fluid that it can make the world a better smelling place. And believers, your life is like that. Your life becomes a pleasant, fragrant aroma in the nostrils of God as you give your life to him for his purposes. Otherwise, I guess I would say our lives are a stench. They stink. Ever been near a skunk that has sprayed? <laughs> What's your life? Is it a sweet smelling savor to God? Be ye therefore followers or imitators or mimics of God as his dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. 